here this morning with Mariana Matsukato. She is a professor of economics and the chair in science and technology policy at the University of Sussex. Welcome. Thank you. You've recently written a small book called The Entrepreneurial State. In the United States, the notion of entrepreneurial and state is not, would not be widely accepted. Right. In fact, I wrote this really out of a sense of urgency. Um, you might even call it a political pamphlet in the old style of the world um, word. So basically, what has been happening in Europe, I would say, over the last 10 years, is they've been looking at places like Silicon Valley and asking, why, aren't, you know, why don't we have a Silicon Valley in Europe? Why don't we have Googles and our own Amazons in Europe? What should we do? And one of the answers to this has been to actually withdraw the state and to try to bring in the types of things that they thought were actually the cause of Silicon Valley, like venture capital or different types of state programs focused around SMEs, which they thought were very important. And the reason I wrote this book was actually to say, OK, if we want a Silicon Valley in Europe, let's go actually see what happened in Silicon Valley. Um, and building on the work of people like Fred Block, um, the idea was if we want more Googles. If we want our own Googles, we actually need more state, not less. But we also have to understand specifically what the state has done. It has not just been about uh, you know, Keynesian fiscal stimulus during recessions. It has not just been about you know, building sort of important infrastructure or creating the right conditions for innovation to happen. It's actually been very targeted type investments, you know, thinking about nanotech before the business sector actually dreamed you know, about it thinking about biotechnology before business or even different types of government actually thought about it. There was people within um, the, the NSF and the NIH who really thought about how to structure the biotech industry. Um, and to, when you really look at those stories, and of course the internet being the most important story with DARPA mm -hmm. um, having both thought about it as well as actually commercialized it, you start realizing that we as economists lack the kind of words that can describe that process. Um, it's not just about the state fixing markets, you know, the market failure approach. It's not even just about what Schumpeterians have talked about in terms of the state being important in creating the right conditions for innovation, so strong industry university links. It's actually been something much more uh, targeted, mission-oriented, creating and shaping markets, not just fixing them. And again, um, the fact that we don't have words to describe this within economics mm -hmm. has, I think, blinded us, and especially now, but not only now, during this crisis. The fact that we don't have words for this <laughs> is, I think, limiting also the solutions. Um, and so, um, so, so, so when I wrote the book, it was really directed to the government in the country where I currently live, which is the UK, which um, I think most people agree is really the country right now pushing austerity. In fact, there's all these stories about the Republicans in the US you know, admiring what Cameron is doing. And to say, be careful, because you're actually you know, withdrawing the engine for innovation if you actually cut away at the state so much and think it's all going to happen through, say, venture capital. Because venture capital, of course, and biotech came in 15 years after the state the laid state the groundwork. Yeah. They've ridden the wave. They've surfed the wave of these state investments. Um, and, and the reason I called it the entrepreneurial state, as opposed to, say, the innovation state or something, is because the word entrepreneurship has really, in some ways, been hijacked. It's often talked about in terms of you know, startups or um, you know, some sort of entrepreneurial spirit that somehow is you know, within the private sector and all the state needs to do is to unleash it. Um, but if you take the word to mean sort of investments in high risk, high uncertain areas, um, then what that requires you to do when then you look at the state's role in say these particular sectors or particular economies in moments in time, is actually identify where are the uncertain and high risk areas. So clean technology today, if you look at what venture capital is doing, it's actually investing in some of the more incremental areas. Mm -hmm. um, the state, through its different organizations in different countries, is actually investing in the you know, high capital intensity, high technological and market risk areas within clean tech. In pharmaceuticals, Marsha Angel's written a lot about this. Yes. Uh, the NIH has not just invested in the pharma industry. It's invested in the highest risk areas of the pharma industry. So new molecular entities with priority rating instead of just Me Too drugs. Me Too drugs are 
um, drugs that are basically just slight variations of existing drugs. So Viagra with a different color, different dosage. A, a patent evasion. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and so this is the myth. The myth that somehow we have this entrepreneurial, dynamic, creative, fast, interesting private sector in this slow, inertial, bureaucratic state sector, which at best can tame the business cycle, do infrastructure projects, you know, um, roads, bridges, schools, um, and even, for the most progressives, create the conditions for this dynamic private sector to thrive. That's a myth. It's often been, not always, not in every country, but it has actually often been an advanced capitalism, the state that has invested in the highest uncertainty, the highest risk areas, and hence, I call it the entrepreneurial state. And if that's true, <laughs> two things. One, we have to be very careful right now in Europe. If we want Europe to be more entrepreneurial, um, austerity is not gonna get us there, for sure. But two, um, if we want to continue to allow the state to play this role, because it has played this role, we need to think much more strategically about how the state can get back a return. Mm -hmm. Because you wouldn't expect the state to get back a return just from its, say, investments in the social, say, welfare state, you know, whether it's education or just basic health care type investments. The, the return is the value to the people, but it's not a financial return. Well, there's two types of returns. One is the indirect return through taxes, okay? So that has been, obviously had. So when the state did play this role, say in the 80s and 90s, and both the computer and the internet industry, um, well, the whole dot-com sector, if you want. The California university system raised well, the productivity of the state and generated more state tax revenue. Absolutely. Yeah. So that is happening. There is an indirect return through taxation. But the question is, when it plays this more entrepreneurial role in investing, very specifically in key sectors in the early stage, in most cases, of the sector, before, like as I said in biotech, before the private sector enters, because again, they're waiting for the state to absorb this uncertainty, but even more high-risk firms. So, you know, Apple, Compaq, Intel, they all got their early, um, early stage money from the public sector. So the SBIR grants. Despite the uh, affection for Ayn Rand among leading executives in Silicon Valley. Exactly, That's exactly. That's quite an interesting, uh, that is interesting, an interesting surprise, story. a selective yeah. sense of uh, how they got to where they, uh, yes. where they did. That's true. Or, but, but also in, in other countries, in Finland, it was a public funding body that funded the early stage of Nokia, mm -hmm. right? Citra is, is, is the name of this agency. But so the question is, in these more entrepreneurial, very high risk, and by that I mean very high failure probability, mm -hmm. um, investments, can we continue to assume that it's just gonna be through the indirect mechanism that the state then reaps back a reward? Because currently, you know, the budgets of many of these agencies are, have been quite reduced. So the question is, I mean, to put it provocatively, had the state earned a much more direct return through its investments in IT, and the whole IT revolution, which as we know, um, and again, I was say, is, oh. if the U.S. Treasury was a big stakeholder in Apple, yes, the uh, budget deficits wouldn't be so large, and people wouldn't uh, fear that people investing were essentially just giving money away and subsidizing yes. the powerful. Yeah, because they don't know. In fact, the U.S. population doesn't know. But the, but the point is, um, had the state in the U.S., for example, reaped back a direct return from its investments in IT, there would be so much more money today for the state to be investing in green technology. Mm -hmm. But the money's not there. Um, but what you just said is really important, actually, because there's also the public perception problem. Trust. Because, Trust in the public sector to make these, yes. what you might call, gambles or risky decisions. Yes, but also um, the, the perception of, say, the U.S. population who right now is hearing, you know, these stories from the Tea Party and from the Republicans in general that we don't want, for example, the state to be meddling in our health care. Mm -hmm. If those people knew what we just said before, <laughs> that the state has not just been trying to, say, reform the health care system, but is actually responsible for creating mm -hmm. something like 75 percent of the most innovative new drugs in public labs, mm -hmm. they would see the state's role in health care in a very different way. So it's not, again, that you have this thriving, vibrant, dynamic, creative, private pharmaceutical industry and the state is just coming in there to try to somehow regulate it. It's actually been that the state has played this entrepreneurial, dynamic, creative role, as well as also wanting to reform the system because that's about access. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, by the way, a very important point because another thing that's happening in Europe, there's this EC 2020 strategy. And the big point that they're pushing in Europe right now is what we need is a particular type of growth. Growth that is smart, inclusive, and sustainable. Now, um, 
first of all, again, coming back to the problem in economics, we have very little frameworks, very few frameworks that actually teach us what it means to talk about smart and inclusive growth together. It used to be um, in the time of the classical economists that these two things were always studied together. So David Ricardo, when he was studying mechanization, which at his time was something new, the immediate thing he did was look at the wage profit uh, distribution that was that was um, resulting from mechanization. So mechanization being, let's just say, innovation, the wage profit distribution being distribution, so inclusiveness, if you want to understand that, how. That balances it. It's, yeah, impact. that used to be studied together. What's happened basically is in the last 100 years, I would say, people who study innovation like me are on one side, and then you have the labor economists doing, if you want, wages and the labor market. What we really need is a framework that actually brings these two back together. And these areas of thinking about how the state's role in directing a particular, if you want, sector can also potentially direct it in a, in a particular way, mm -hmm. right? Because within sectors, there's different paths that innovation can take. Um, and I find very inspiring what's happening in Brazil. So uh, they have a public healthcare system called SUS, the equivalent of the NHS, say in the UK. And what you see there, and I think the only other country you see it also is in Cuba, but that's a whole sort of different framework, is you have the state through its, if you want, welfare institution of its public health care system, working very closely also with the industrial policy part of its, if you want, apparatus, as well as a public development bank called BNDS, thinking about what kind of healthcare system do we want? What kind of innovation within biotech and pharmaceuticals do we want? How do we actually also achieve access to those drugs? Because don't forget that the two countries right now, two of the countries that are the most innovative in pharmaceuticals are the US and India. So they're great at innovating in pharma, but they're really bad <laughs> at access and actually getting those drugs to the population because of the lack of a proper sort of healthcare system. So thinking again about smart and inclusive growth is, is, is very challenging. We need to understand which models out there are there where this is sort of even being attempted seriously as opposed to just talking about it. Because I would say that even though it is a strategy for the EC 2020, I would say that when they look at inclusion, they look at inclusion. When they look at smart innovation, they, you know, innovation-led growth, they look at that. But the actual tools to understand how these two things can go together, I would say it's quite empty. And so again, looking at Brazil, um, since Lula, and it's also happening right now with the current presidency, they actually explicitly say, we want to be both investing in the innovative part of biotech and pharma, but we also want to be directing to some extent that innovation. So for example, through generics, through the generic industry as well, it, but not only, also sort of more standard biotech. Um, and we need to set up funding agencies, especially through their public um, development bank, which can actually allow this to happen because they don't mythologize, as Europe does, I would say, um, what happened in Silicon Valley. They or, know. or demonize the state. Or demonize the state, exactly. No. No. Now, why do you, mm. we're talking now really about culture. Mm. Why do you think in America or Great Britain, the state is demonized, particularly in the case of the United mm. States, where the historical evidence suggests the positive role that the state has played in yep. the entrepreneurial platform? And yet in Brazil, yeah. there seems to be an acceptance and an affirmation yeah. of this, this part of the structure. I think that's a very complicated question, and, you, and I think for sure you, um, you know, it's more in some ways a political scientist who can explain this historically better. But I think the point is, um, and it's not every place in Europe, by the way, because you know, as I said, in Scandinavia, they don't. So it's really the Anglo-Saxon economists, I think, that have been most responsible for demonizing the state. I think the point is that those countries that have not demonized the state haven't just said the state is good, right? I mean, that would be very simplistic. The state is good and the private sector is, you know, sort of just inertial. That's not the point. What they've done and what I'm trying to do through my work is to say, okay, let's talk about um, what happens in modern capitalism as a division of labor. And in terms of my particular area, with this, which is innovation, and, um, a division of innovative labor, you have different actors. You have large firms, you have small firms, you have the state through its different agencies, including, as I was saying, in some countries, uh, public development banks or investment banks. What role have they actually played? So instead of just saying, oh, venture capital is great and the state, we just sort of keep it to the side. You have to look at, say, in particular sectors, in particular moments and times, in terms of this landscape of uncertainty and landscape of risk, 
where each player played the most important role. Because let me just give you another example. It's not just that the state has been demonized, and for example, in the UK, we've also had this very strange acceptance. People just kind of believe it, even though there's no evidence for it, that small firms, that SMEs, have been somehow underfunded. So there's this whole... SMEs, small and medium small enterprises. Small and medium enterprises, yeah. exactly, yes. So, in fact, if you look at the data, every year, SMEs, the small and medium enterprises, in the UK, get something like, um, it depends whose study you look at, but these um, two studies I've looked at recently, between seven and eight billion pounds of indirect and, um, and direct support. That's more than the whole university system, more um, than the police force. So it's very hard to say they have been underfunded. <laughs> what you can say is that within the SME sector, and, and I've also built partly on this work, there's only something like five to seven percent of these companies that actually produce any value to the economy in terms of new jobs um, and products, new products, what, what new services. What about the uh, employment impacts of these entrepreneurial state actions? Have they been large-scale employers in addition to large-scale productive innovators? Um, well, I'm mean, coming back to the SME thing. Is, is that something like? So as I was saying, about five percent of these SMEs do create jobs and do create products. And if you look at those, those are the ones that receive the most state support. Mm -hmm. So again, again, we're coming back that it's not just about the state having invested in a particular sector, say through R&D, which it has done. We know that's very important. But also in funding these particular types of companies, what we nowadays call these high growth innovative companies. And these are the ones that within the SME sector have created the most jobs. And these are the ones that often, in these different studies that we've been looking at, have received the most state support. Mm -hmm. So. Again, it's the, the state's ability to actually be willing to invest in areas where the private sector ignores, reluctant, which is, yeah. again, not just about the sectors, but these particular types of firms, which are very high risk, because they are thinking about the long run and investing in human capital and investing in innovation, which, you know, the 19 uncertainty thing is innovation is the best example. There's 90% failure rates, right? So when you're investing in these highly innovative companies, you probably will lose your money. <laughs> um, so when but you, when you do win, yeah. you want to have a coupon yes. or an ownership certificate yes. that entitles you to some of the paybacks. It's like oil drilling. You have a bunch of dry holes and then you hit an oil well. On average, you might be profitable because of the right. vitality of the ones that succeed. But you can't, but in you essence, can't. get all There's of the no losses guarantee. and then watch the gains go yep. run away without any... Uh, yep. Benefits but your question about the jobs, there's also evidence um, that the Keynesian multiplier, so the degree to which output actually increases beyond just the investment that's made uh, because of the rounds of spending, you know, the spending cycles that um, result, is higher in those cases where this public sector investment has been targeted. So as opposed to, again, just sort of digging ditches and filling them up again, or even um, just kind of building general um, needed infrastructure, in those cases where public investment has actually been guided towards these, if you want, missions, whether it's health or the green economy today or IT, the multiplier effect and hence the effect on jobs is higher. Mm -hmm. And this is very important because the point is, I think the way that Keynes has been misinterpreted is that somehow you just need this active state during the bust. Digging ditches or whatever. Uh, yeah. No, no, but, but also innovation, let's say. You know, I mean, many people are arguing today, oh, we should be investing in the green economy today in order to get us out of the recession, which I would agree with. What I don't agree with is that you only need that during the bust, even in the booms. So in the 1990s, that was, there was plenty of growth happening, and in those years, we see the state having played this very entrepreneurial role investing mm -hmm. in, again, in pharma, as well as the internet. That was in the 90s and the 80s when you did have growth. So I think we've missed something in the Keynesian story. And Keynes himself, it's quite interesting, if you look at sort of in between the lines what he said, um, there's a famous letter he wrote to Roosevelt in 1926 or 1927, I can't remember, but he, he says in there, um, he says, you know what, in the end, the business sector, they're not wolves, they're not lions, they're actually a bunch of domesticated animals, and our role is actually sort of to draw out the wolves yes. in them, which is quite <laughs> ironic if you think about it, because in, then he used the word animal spirits to talk about private investment and why you needed government mm -hmm. spending, right? Because GDP has four types of demand. You have private consumption, private investment, government expenditures, and net exports. And his main sort of story line, or the way that people talk about the, the need for Keynes and stimulus is that because I, the private investment part, is so volatile, because it's so 
and, sorry, it's volatile and very pro-cyclical, there's often not enough. Mm -hmm. um, hence, you need counter-cyclical government spending. Um, but the way he described the eye being so volatile, he used this word animal spirits, which, yes, there's the downside to it is that it's too pro-cyclical, so you don't have enough in the recession, but it does have this kind of aura of being exciting, right? The private investment expenditures, animal spirits are just kind of, you know, dying to invest in new opportunities. But then there's this letter where he says, you know, actually, they're a bunch of domesticated animals, kind of <laughs> pussycats, you know, um, not lions. And so I'm very interested in that. In fact, a follow-up of um, the book that I wrote, the booklet, the political pamphlet that I wrote called Entrepreneurial State. I'm now writing a proper book on it, really actually thinking about the theoretical implications. I'm thinking about calling it government's uh, animal spirits really? <laughs> and the myth about uh, sort of the lions versus the um, domesticated animals something around that. I'll probably have a zoo picture somewhere in the beginning. Um, but this is a very key point. This is the point that um, I think is missed in the Keynesian story. You know, is the pro does the private sector simply need to be unleashed by the government sector? Um, does it simply need to create the conditions, what we call the framework conditions, um, which in my area of research we talk about in terms of national systems of innovation. You know, this is the kind of stuff that Japan did very well in the 70s and 80s in the Soviet Union. Some people say the reason it fell was because they didn't have a proper national system of innovation. They had lots of research in these academies. They didn't have these horizontal links um, between, for example, the, the science base and the private sector, as well as within the companies they were very... Um, in, in, in the Soviet Union, very vertical. So what Japan did is both internally in the companies, they had much more if you want, horizontal links in terms of teamwork, but also they set up uh, different ways in which you know, new knowledge can actually be diffused throughout the economy. Um, now this is all about framework conditions, and that's a very important thing that helps us understand the rise of Japan and the fall of the Soviet Union, but it also doesn't help us understand, I think, so we focused on it a bit too much, this roaring <laughs> potential entrepreneurial role of government. And coming back to uh, BNDS, because I was just there and it really excited me talking to um, the Vice President, Xiao Ferraz, is you see that particular public investment bank, which I think we're dying for in Europe right now, because the European Investment Bank is not taking it's this role. It's contracting its balance sheet. It's contracting its, its balance good. sheet. It's not playing a role with the Troika. Mm -hmm. um, what you see is not only counter-cyclical, I mean, they're completely counter-cyclical, the BNDS, the amount of investments since 2007 have just skyrocketed, but they also really understand sort of innovation, and they've been investing in the particular areas of different sectors where the private sector has been, um, you know, really too scared. And what's very interesting is they're earning back something like 20% return on equity. Uh, the equivalent in China, I think, is 8%, the Chinese Development Bank. The equivalent of the World Bank return on equity is minus 2%. So not only are they counter-cyclical, not only do they have the courage to pick particular sectors, but within those sectors, they're also picking these very sort of high-risk areas, but high potential return. Off. Yeah, and they're, they are probably one of the leaders right now, along with China and Finland, in investing in you know, what we call the green economy. Um, and yet, in the UK and, and in the US, we have this fear of picking winners. Um, but we've always picked winners. It's just a matter of how you then structure these state organizations that they understand how that works. And you have to, by the way, welcome failure. Yes. So, or, or how we say it's part, it's an organic part of the process. Yeah, but you have to, I mean, I think this is the challenge, because when I tell, you know, when I talk to people about this and I get quite excited about it, they say, yeah, but hold on, you know, the state agencies that I know about are very bureaucratic, and of course, that is a problem. But if you look at the success cases, and I would say DARPA and BNDS are two sort of model cases we should really study, how they've organized themselves in such a way that they understand this mm -hmm. risk landscape. So there's lots of stories about DARPA that they um, set themselves up in such a way that they were bringing in people from outside who, you know, for say maybe four years, it was not a permanent job, scientists who had other places to go to, and they basically gave them the task, you know, be crazy, you know, the sort of Steve Jobs type thing, be foolish, be crazy, in biotech, steer us in the right direction in the internet. Um, well, I think the uh, challenge that your vision presents, mm. that in addition to the stimulative role, the Keynesian macroeconomic role, with the possibility of generating productivity, in addition to the regulatory role or the yes. conditions, that there is some which might play part of the spectrum 
in an environment of radical uncertainty that the private sector won't play, mm -hmm. and that a more vital society, one that flies on a higher trajectory, really depends upon Absolutely. recognizing that history and understanding that, that role in the context of economic theory. Yes. I look forward to your uh, continued writing. Thank and you. The Entrepreneurial State was a, you call it a pamphlet, I thought it was a delightful little book. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Please come back and see us again. Thank you. The next mm -hmm. time, uh, I would say, a new installment yes. of your understanding, and uh, we'll all look at the Brazilian situation and look at these historical examples uh, that you shed so much light on. Thank you. Thanks Thank very, you very much. much.